our whole heart now is the time. Now is the time because it might even get crazier out there. Well, Father, right now we just ask in the person and by the person of the Holy Spirit for your anointing of grace, your anointing of wisdom and knowledge and revelation to be upon this. We ask, Father God, that it will be a rhema word, a worm word that is a life-giving word. The engrafted becomes the engrafted word of God. It literally becomes part of who we are and it becomes part of the fabric of our nature and our soul. And we ask you to anoint this with grace and truth. And I ask this in the precious name of Yeshua and all the people said. Amen. Amen. So last Sunday we found out that we are instruments of praise unto God. Amen. Amen. You and I are instruments of praise unto God. God gave us vocal cords. The Bible calls them pipes there in Ezekiel. Say, I have pipes to praise the Lord. That's why God gave you vocal cords to praise the Lord. David said, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. And so that, that's an interesting concept that David is saying that, that my pray, or excuse me, the praise that I give will continually, it won't just be on Sunday morning. It won't just be when things are going exactly right. The Lord, praise the Lord will be continually on my mouth and in my spirit. And so I just want to read a couple chapters, or excuse me, a couple verses, and then one uh, short chapter out of Psalms. And I want to start with Ephesians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, he writes, according to he hath chosen, as he hath chosen. Everybody say chosen. Chosen. Us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You were chosen before the foundation of the world. That's an interesting concept right there, that God chose you a long, long, long time ago. Now, I want to stay in Ephesians, and I just want to go over to chapter 2 and look at verse two, 10. And Paul says, for we are, we are his workmanship. Say, I am his workmanship. I am his workmanship. That you are the workmanship of Christ. That is important for you to understand. You are the workmanship of God. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Hallelujah. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So God ordained you. He chose you before the foundation of the world. He chose the work for you. He chose the calling for you. Before you were ever conceived in your mother or father's eyes or a gleam in your father's eyes, God chose you and what he wanted you to do on this earth. Can you say amen? amen. My question is, are you doing it? Amen. I didn't get an amen there. Hallelujah. Well, that's okay. I want to read out of Psalm. I want to read just one particular chapter. And in Psalms, that can be scary. Some chapters are really long, or it can be a delight, because some chapters are really short. But I, I want to read this particular, it's considered probably one of the greatest prose ever written. It, it's, it's probably quoted more than any other psalm. In fact, it is. It's the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can you say amen? Amen. Uh, I want to go back and just, I want to reread verse 3. For he restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes. Amen. Not your sake, not for your name's sake, for his name's sake. Say for his name's sake with me. For his name's sake. Can you say amen to the reading of the Word of God? Amen. For his name's sake. Well, it's interesting what God will do for his name's sake. It's interesting. So I, I just want you to sit by whoever you're sitting by. I want you to look at him and tell him, man, you are sitting next to an important person. Look at him and tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> say, I'm sitting next to a very important person. 
I just read you scripture that, that says you were chosen before the foundation of the world, that God had ordained works for you before the foundation of the world. You are sitting next to somebody that is, is an original. Nobody else has your thumbprint, your eye print. You are an original to God. When God made you, he threw away the mold, and you are the one and only that God created in his image to look exactly like you and be exactly who you are. Say, I'm special to God. I'm special to God. You are chosen by God, and he has ordained your life. So I want you to keep that in mind that God has thoughts and plans for you. He had ordained you for good works before you were ever created. And so as we get into today's sermon, I, I want to ask you something. Have you ever come across a word called planned obsolescence? Anybody know what that word means? Planned obsolescence. Well, uh, I, I'm going to explain what that is so you'll understand that. Because the enemy wants planned obsolescence in our life. And Jesus came to make sure that doesn't happen and bring his restoration and his regeneration in our lives. So in economics, I want to explain, plan. have you ever bought a car and it didn't run as long as you thought it should? It didn't perform the way you thought it should. And you got frustrated with a manufacturer. You got frustrated with issues with a car. And there's one day you finally just took the car back to the dealer and said, here, take it back. Just, I'm the only one that's ever done that. Three or four of you, five of you, uh, you're ever fast enough. So in economics, it's an industrial design. It's called planned obsol obsolescence. And it has literally started in America, in Detroit, by the auto manufacturers. So let me just tell you what it is. It's called planned obsolescence or premature obsolescence. And now you begin to understand why some of your American-made cars don't last the way you think they should. Okay, it's a policy of planning or designing a product with an artificially limited useful life so that it becomes obsolete, unfashionable, or no longer functional. And after a certain amount of period of time, the rationale behind this strategy is to generate long-term sales volume by reducing the time between repeat purchases, referred to as shortening the replacement cycle. It is a deliberate shortening of a lifespan of a product to force consumers to purchase new products. Now do you understand what planned obsolescence is? Uh -huh. Years ago I was in Sholo and I was talking to uh, a car dealer in Sholo and he's a very well known car dealer. He probably sold more cars in Sholo than all the other places combined. And on his lot he had two lots. One lot was a lot of American manufactured cars on this side. On this side, it was a lot of foreign manufactured cars. And no, I'm not going to give names or anything like that. And I noticed that he and his wife only drove this one particular style of car made by this one manufacturer that was a foreign company. And that's all he drove, his wife drove, and his children never drove. They never drove these cars, ever. And so one day I asked him, he was a friend of mine, and I said, why do you drive specifically this kind of car? He said, because they do not have planned obsolescence. I said, what is planned obsolescence? He said, this car was not built to fail. These vehicles were not built to fail. These vehicles were built to fail. Amen. And I got an education. And so now you can go home with that education. You come to me after church and I'll tell you which vehicle to buy. And I said, why don't the American manufacturers do that? He said, they can, they don't want to. He said, it is a mindset that got a hold in Detroit and it is still going on in Detroit. And then all of a sudden there was an invasion from different parts of the world that made it cars that were designed to last indefinitely. And guess what? I drive one of those cars today that is designed to last indefinitely. And I praise God for that. I got into sister, a conversation with my sister one time about this, and she said, no, I just buy this particular brand because I never have problems. I said, I've never heard of a car that didn't have problems. She said, buy one and you'll find out. Guess what? She's right. I asked, I asked this gentleman, can, can, can the American manufacturers do it? He said, absolutely they can. He said they don't want to. Okay, so now that you understand that, let's get into the sermon. Look at your neighbor again and tell him you're sitting by a very important person. So sit up straight and listen. Do you know you are a product of God Incorporated? Do you know you physically are a product of God Incorporated? Amen. You know, everywhere product is created, anywhere in the world, it should be the heart and the desire of the manufacturer for his or their product to perform to the standard specifications for which they made it. Wouldn't that be wonderful if all manufacturers built their products that way today? No manufacturer is pleased, a true manufacturer is pleased when his product fails. 
In fact, the manufacturer is so concerned about his product that he gives, what, guarantees and warranties on their products if they are a reputable manufacturer. Every manufacturer's goal is not purchase, but it is truly performance. And I'm going to explain that to you. Product purchase is secondary to product performance. Because the manufacturer knows that his credibility is related to the performance, not the purchase. A true manufacturer's passion is not for you to purchase his product. His passion is for his product to perform to his specifications and your expectations. And this is what every manufacturer knows. Because if the product performs, the purchase is automatic. If the product performs, the purchase is automatic. I've bought the same brand of car now eight times. Not just for me and her, but I bought it for my children. The reality is, if the product performs, the purchase is automatic. Say, if I perform, if I perform, perform, the reward is automatic. God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. God is a, say with me, God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So if I get off track, I can always go back to the manufacturer's guidelines and handbooks and specifications and find out where I'm wrong, what I need to change, and where I can get back on track. Can you say amen to a manufacturer's handbook for your life? I praise God for a manufacturer's handbook. So the company's name and reputation is not in the customer, but it's in the product and the way that it performs. So the company literally is as good as the performance of its product. I want to talk about some some products that are so good they don't even have to advertise today. Do you know that there are products out there that do not advertise, they don't need to advertise, because they produce and they perform so well, they don't even have to advertise. Could you imagine having a product that was wonderful? Do you know you've never seen a commercial for a Ferrari? You never will. Quality never goes on sale. It doesn't need to. It doesn't have to. You've never seen a commercial for Rolls Royce. So I, I want to just mention some companies that have been so successful with their product that they don't have to advertise and their product does not have to go on sale. Have you ever heard of Hoi Fong Foods? But I bet you've heard of Sriracha. Mm-hmm. Sriracha. Anybody heard of Sriracha sauce? Mm-hmm. Any, anybody heard of Sriracha? Jack, you have not heard of Sriracha. Brother, I am going to educate you today. I'm going to get you a bottle this week and send it to your house. <laughs> anybody know what Sriracha sauce is? Most of the world knows exactly what it is. It will, it will liven up any food you ever eat. I promise you. And they don't have to advertise because they're so successful. Do you realize Costco doesn't have to advertise? Do you know Krispy Kreme does not have to advertise? Anybody ever been to that Krispy Kreme donut store and look in the window? And I remember the first time I ever had a Krispy Kreme, I was told about them. They weren't open yet. And I went and I looked in the window there and I saw that magic carpet ride of donuts coming down there. And I got news for you. Once you see that, you cannot resist going in there and getting one of those donuts. They, they're so successful, they don't need to advertise. How about Kiehl's, which is uh, skin and hair care? Any women ever heard of Kiehl's? Revon bought them for millions and millions, but Revon said it's so successful, we will, not, we will advertise our Revon products, but the people that are dedicated to Kiehl's are so dedicated, we never have to advertise for that product. It's skin and hair care. I've never heard of it, but I found out it's quite a big deal. Anybody ever heard of Spanx? All the women shaking their head, the men like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I remember getting spanked as a kid, but no, there's something called Spanx. She doesn't have to advertise, and yet she's a billionaire. She created something. So what is interesting is, have you ever have a product that failed and you got frustrated with the product and you said, I'll never buy this product again. I'll never buy from this company again. I've never bought a GM car in 21 years. And that's exclusively the only thing I would drive because my daddy drove GM. 
So do any of you have products stacked up in your garage sitting there that are half-baked, half-performed, and you didn't take them back, and so your garage is full of things and products you have bought that do not work, that did not live up to the advertiser's or the manufacturer's specification or their advertisement? Does anybody have a garage full of things like that, products like that, that you have in your garage that never worked, quit working, or you finally just put them somewhere in a storage closet and just had them stacked up there, and you were waiting until there was enough time that you had to go put them in a mini storage and pay somebody to store them for you because you didn't want to throw them away. And that is an American tradition that we have. So it will give a company a bad name when the product does not perform to the standards that the manufacturer promised. Scott, is this microphone on? Okay. Okay, so anytime that you have problems with a product, whose name Whose name do you fault? The manufacturer. So therefore the claims of the manufacturer must be equal to the ability, potential, or the capacity of the product for the product to be successful. That's why manufacturers work hard to make sure that he puts into his product what he tells you to demand from it. They spend millions of dollars on research and development trying to formulate this idea and this concept of creating a product that will perform at the level that the manufacturer's handbook says that it will do. Do any of you have a vehicle that has a manufacturer's handbook is about one inch thick or a lot more, and your vehicle will actually do more things than you even know it will do, and you still haven't figured out all that it is capable of doing? Anybody in the room? Man, is, can any of you read? Uh, just ask a question. <laughs> so there are things your vehicle can do that are in the manufacturer's handbook that it, you have not found out yet. What, so there are things you can do in your life that the manufacturer's handbook says you can, but you just have not read deep enough or far enough into the manufacturer's handbook to experience everything that God says you can do and is available to you here in his manufacturer's handbook for your life. Can you say amen? amen. Well, I got good news for you. Everybody in this room is a product of a company called Elohim International. <laughs> Jehovah Universal. Do you know you were made and crafted and created by God himself? Yes. Do, do, how many do you realize you were made and created, handcrafted, chosen by God, ordained by God, planned with a life that had a preordained plan for your life, and God says, I want you to understand the beauty of that and the joy of that, that God chose me and preordained me for good works in the earth. Yes. God has chosen you. Can you say amen? Amen. So you're, you're not just an ethereal thing walking around trying to trip through life, trying to figure out everything out. God has a very specific plan for your life. So when God produced us, the manufacturer, he said himself, he said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Look at your neighbor and say, I made in his image and I made in his likeness. I may not always act like it sometimes, but you are made in his image and you are made in his likeness. That's what the manufacturer's handbook says about you. Somebody say amen. amen. I am made in his image and his likeness and he tells me so. He said, I'm going to make a product and it's going to be called man and we will put our own image in it, our own likeness in it. Therefore, he created you to perform a predetermined, predestined, prescribed life. Prescribed plan. Say, God knows what's inside of me. Look at your neighbor. God knows what's inside of you. Look at man. God knows what's inside of you. Look at woman. God knows what's inside of you. So sometimes we think that what we have for our life is so important. We think it's so necessary and so desirable. And a lot of times we waste time chasing what I call fantasies. Anybody ever chased a fantasy? The Bible does not tell us to have fantasy. The Bible clearly talks about dreams and visions and not fantasy. The difference between a dream and a vision is a dream has vision, a fantasy has division. That's when you know it's a fantasy. Because if it's one day it's this and the next day it's that, that is a fantasy because a vision has no division. That's, that's the power of God, getting a God-given vision for our lives. So Ephesians 1, 5, 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. So sometimes, you know, we, we need to understand that when people see you, they should see Jesus walking around on two legs. Yes. They should see God walking around on two legs. What do people see when they see you coming? Are you like the monk that comes in? Hard bad. Are you like the monk that comes in? Bad food. 
Are you like the monk that comes in every day? Bad TV. What are you presenting to the earth? It's very important what God has called you to present. I'm just going to ask you that question. What do you present when you run into people? When people see you and you walk into a room, what do they get? What kind of representation of God do they get? So we're not created just to take up space, lay around and do nothing. We're created to live productive, effective, meaningful lives. In fact, Romans tells us in chapter in Romans 8 that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And I can do all things through Christ. If God be for us, who can be against us? God says we are conquerors and more than conquerors. That's a whole other sermon. So to do good works. Well, that God has created you to do good works. Are you known for your good works? Are you known for you? God created you unto good works. God created you unto good works. That's a revelation for many Christians. That God just didn't create you to save you, take heaven. God created you to get to busy and get to work here in the earth and to do good works unto men and to lead people to Jesus Christ because they see Jesus Christ effective and alive in your life. And God said those good works, they were prepared before the world began. God had good works for you to do. Hallelujah. That means you're not a mistake. That means you're not a nobody. That means you're not good for anything. That means God has a specific plan, specific details for your life, and created unto good works. We found out last week that one of the good works we are created to was to be a praise and worship instrument to God. So I'll tell you what, next, next, next week or next Monday, tomorrow morning when you go into work, why don't you go in praising God with that on your lips when they come in so that people look at you and wonder, what's going on with you? Say, well, I'm praising God because he has led me and guided me and I'm going to be up to good works today. So you better look out because the glory of God's coming in with me into the room today. Hallelujah. So I got to repeat that. Listen to the words. You are his product. Listen to that. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship. Everybody say workmanship. workmanship. Oh, I like that. I like that. Because whenever I feel bad about myself or feel like I failed or feel like, man, I've blown it, I realize, hold it, I am the workmanship of God in Christ Jesus. Say, I'm the workmanship of God in Christ Jesus. I am the workmanship of God in Christ Jesus. Ooh, that means you are a handcrafted, specified thing that God is working on, that God is working out your salvation. He's the author and finisher of that. Say, God is at work in me. I, I praise God for it. You're a product he created. He said, I'm going to work out this process in your life. Yes. Hallelujah. I, oh, I, I just love that. Yes. He ordained me to do good works, works before the world began. I am his product. You are his product that he worked on. And you were created and fashioned in the mold of Christ, his son. Did you get that? You were formed and fashioned in the mold of Christ, his son. Let me go back and read that in Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship. Oh, created in Christ Jesus. So I am created in the mold of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are created in the mold of Jesus Christ. That is a hallelujah. That's the mold. That's the mold you're created in. Say you're sitting by somebody really important. You really are. I don't think you believe it, but you really, really are according to God's word. Generally, no company releases a product until they're sure it can perform what it's designed to do. Generally, that, that's the way good operating companies do that manufacture. They don't deliver something until it's absolutely able to perform what it is designed to do. So I, I think about that. God did not allow you to be conceived. Think about this. In your mother's womb until he was certain that you were equipped. Equipped to perform everything he designed and gave you permission to do. Everything he designed and gave you permission. God said, I'm not going to let Stephen come until he's ready, until he's equipped to be designed to everything I have called him to do. I got news for you. God had you right, he designed you and built you, and he had you come at the right time, at the right place, at the right moment for his exact work, perfect work, and the work that he has given you to do. God says, you are not a mistake. You are here exactly by my design. Hallelujah. You're here by the design of God. I don't care who your mother and father were. You're here by the design of God. Hallelujah. So I'm not a mistake. And 2 Timothy tells us that the man of God may be equipped, be complete, and thoroughly equipped for every good. God has equipped you for every good work. Think about that. 
Every good work. When you leave here today, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to put this whoop on you, the result and understanding I'm equipped for good works. So that when I go out next week and go around the community, people are going to see the good works of God that he has put in me since the creation of time. God has put something in you for you to do. There are people waiting for you to minister to them, to tell them about Jesus Christ, to love them, to care for them, to pray for them. There's somebody needing what God has put in you and designed for you to do. Somebody is waiting for you to come and be Jesus Christ in that situation and bring the hands and feet of God to that situation. Can you say amen? Somebody out there needs your anointing and your gifting. That's why the dreams in your heart are equal to the ability in your soul. God will not ask you to do something he cannot put in. He has not given you the capacity to do. If God's put it in you, he's given you the capacity to do it. That's why the vision in your life is directly equivalent to the power that God has put inside you. That's why your passion is always propelled by your purpose. And that's why God wants you to live with reward and not regret. That's because you need to understand the saint of God. Your ability, your ability is tied to your responsibility. Your ability is tied to your responsibility. Your ability is tied to your responsibility. See, God created you with two important principles tied to you. And I ask you to think on these things this week. Your success is related to your assignment by God. Your success in the earth is related to your assignment from God. If you don't do what you're born to do, you will die doing what you hate to do. I promise you that. I've watched people do that. I'll say that again. If you don't know what you were born to do, you will die doing what you hate to do. And that's why God is constantly saying in Scripture, Oh, you're going to like this. You're going you're to love this. You're going to love this. All through Scripture, there's a statement that God says over and over and over and over again. And he repeats it. In the statement, he said this statement to Abraham. Did Abraham ever fail? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How about Isaac? Did Isaac ever fail? He said it to Jacob. Did Jacob ever fail? Ooh, Jacob, the deceiver, the trickster, the huckster. He said it to Moses. Did Moses ever fail? He said it to David. He said it to Jonah. He said it to the disciples. He said it to the greatest failures in Scripture. I will do this for my name's sake. The promises that I have made unto you that are yea and amen. He said, even if you fail, I will not stop. I will not quit. God says, if you quit, I'll keep working. I got news for you today. There are people that you thought that you just need to give up on, that you need to let go. And I'm here today to tell you God doesn't quit on any purchase, that he, any, any product he's ever created because he purchased it with his blood. And you've got to understand that when you're purchased with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are one of the most valuable things there is in the universe. Can I tell you something? Your praise and worship is more important to God than the praise and worship of angels. Yes. Somebody got it. Somebody got it. Somebody got it. Your praise and worship is more valuable to God than the worship of angels. Do you know why? Do you know why? Oh, you don't know why. Come next week and I'll tell you. Your praise and worship is redemptive praise and worship. Woo! Your praise and worship is purchased with the blood of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is more valuable than the praise and worship of angels who have not been redeemed. You have been redeemed. And God said, your praise and your worship, the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Your praise and your worship is redemptive praise and worship. Blood brought praise and worship. Praise and worship covered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. You have the most valuable praise in the universe. Last Sunday I told you we took His job. Hallelujah. We are praise and worship instruments under God. That is part of the plan for your life and my life. People look at what you have done. God looks at what he's put in you. Satan's plan is obsolescence. That's his plan for your life. Obsolescence. Done. Retired. No fire. No energy. Just waiting for the grave. But God's plan is good success. God's plan is reward. That's what God has for you. Say good success, good success. and great reward. And great reward. God said, I have plans for you. He said, I've had them since the beginning of time. And it's your job to find out what that is. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you right now, one of the reasons the enemy is so mad at you is you and I took his place. We took his place. 
He got kicked out of heaven. The praise and worship department was lacking. And God said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a choir of men in the earth. Made lower than the angels. Just a little. And God said, I'm going to make them my praise and worship team in the earth today. That's why your praise and worship is so valuable. You can give God the most valuable gift there is. Blood bought. Praise and worship. There's nothing like it to God. Nothing. I'm going to ask you something. Have you ever had your grandchild out of the clear blue look at you and say, I love you, Grandpa? Anybody ever experienced that? Any of you got grandkids? My God. There's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. Why? Because it's blood connected. Brothers and sisters, I, I just want to remind you that you are not a failure. God told David, I will do this, and I have made sure it will happen. That David, in spite of your failure, and many times we, we just look at the failures of David, but God looked at what he had put in David. And it was so powerful that your Bible in the New Testament starts with David in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And ends with David in Revelation 26. My God, that's the man that everybody else gave up on. But God said, I know what I put in him. I know what I put in you. I know what. And I'm after what I, I'm after, I'm after this treasure that I have put in you. I'm here to tell you today, God won't quit on you. He won't quit on your kids. He won't quit on your grandkids. He will not quit on you. He manufactured you. He knows what's in you. And I promise you, he's coming after what he has put in you. And there is a day that you will be rejoicing because you will see God moving in an area that you thought he quit. And God said, I'm just waiting for the right time. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Say with me, the Lord, the Lord will, never quit will never quit on me, on my, children, my children, my grandchildren, my, grandchildren, my, life, my life, my being, my being or anything in my life. Amen. Stand up for the blessing of the Lord. God will not quit on you. Oh, that's, that's, oh, praise you, Jesus. I praise you. God won't quit on you even if you quit. Peter quit, and yet God still showed up. Oh, I, I thank God for his divine mercy and grace. Hear the words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God said, you put my holy name on your children. I will seek them. Put your name on my children, God says. Put the name of Yahweh on your children. God says, I'll, I'll never quit. I'll never quit seeking them. I won't. I won't. If you receive this, say amen. amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Hello, one and all. We have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona, 85902. And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue.